uh, and I, I, they were kind enough to agree to, to let me title it Bomb Scare, because I wanted to talk about the fear factor uh, of nuclear weapons. I wanted to talk uh, about the fear we have about these weapons. Fear is so prevalent in our society. It's used to manipulate us into buying products or wars that we don't need. And it certainly is probably the dominant feeling we have about nuclear weapons. But there's this other part. It's the fascination we have with nuclear weapons because of what we've accomplished, what humankind has done in the 20th century. We have split the atom. We have understood and now manipulated the fundamental basis of, of matter in the universe. And then, with that fission, we moved on to fusion, to hydrogen bombs, to be able to merge together hydrogen atoms, to replicate the processes that power all life, that have produced all atoms in the universe. The fusion that takes place inside the sun and all stars has produced all the matter, the oxygen we breathe, the iron in our blood comes from the stars, comes from the supernova that scatter these elements through the universe. And with the hydrogen bomb in the 1950s, we were able to literally take a peek at that sun and recreate it on Earth. No wonder people have been fascinated by these weapons. No wonder they inspire awe and desire as well as fear. What I've tried to do in Bomb Scare is walk us through that history from the very beginning from the early discoveries in the 1930s all the way up to the crisis with Iran, to sort of give an understanding of what happened here, to, and then to sort of put the current crises in perspective. It's often said that the world we live in is more dangerous now than during the Cold War. That's not true. That is not true. People forget what we've been through. That's the other reason I wrote this book, to remind us of the dangers that we lived through and escaped. When I was in grammar school in St. Rita's in Hamden, Connecticut, every month we would have a bomb drill. The sirens would sound, and the nuns would line us up and we'd go down to the basement, which was our bomb shelter, where we'd have barrels of water and cartons of crackers, preparing for global thermonuclear event. Every Saturday, many, many people remember this, every Saturday in towns all across America, the air raid sirens would be tested at noon. The AM radios, that's all we had, the AM radios would come on with a test of the civil defense system. We were worried in the 50s about Soviet bombers coming over the pole and destroying our entire country. And then after Sputnik in 1959, of instant death from nuclear armed missiles, 30 seconds, 30 minute flight time. That these fears were, were real, these dangers were real, far greater than the dangers we face today. They were picked up in popular literature, popular culture, on the beach, about the survivors of a nuclear war, huddling on a beach in Australia, waiting for the certain death that would come when the radioactive clouds circled the globe and reached reach, reach them. I remember reading the Saturday Evening Post, the serialization of Failsafe, the book about an accidental nuclear war, and of course everybody remembers Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, or how I stopped worrying and learned to love the bomb, you know, with that George C. Scott uh, bit in the, in, the, in the Situation Room, urging the President of the United States, played by Peter Sellers, to go for it to do a preemptive attack on the Soviets. You know, sure, we'd lose 20 million tops, <laughs> but we would win. We would survive. That, he, that captured the sentiment of the time. But it was those fears that really m dominated national politics in those days. And it was those fears that John F. Kennedy confronted in his debate in 1960 with then Vice President Richard Nixon. And Kennedy, as a Democrat, came, came at the Republican Eisenhower and Nixon administration from the right. He accused them of failing to protect America's national security, but he had a left hook. 
He said that Nixon and Eisenhower had failed to secure a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, a treaty that would stop nuclear testing. And he warned that this failure, if it was allowed to continue, would result in not just the four states that currently had nuclear weapons then, the United States, got them in 1945, the Soviet Union, 1949, Great Britain in 1950, and then that year, France in 1960. But he warned, by the end of the next president's first term, the mid-60s, there might be 15, 20, or 25 nations with nuclear weapons. Not rogue states, our allies, our friends, as well as neutral countries might get them. Australia was investigating this. Sweden had a program. Switzerland had a program. West Germany, Japan. Remember, this was just 15 years after World War II. The countries we defeated were discussing getting nuclear weapons. This was the fear that Kennedy had. And he based this on a national intelligence estimate from 1958, the first NIE done on proliferation, that understood then what is denied now, the link between existing arsenals and other people's desire to get these weapons. That NIE warned in 1958 that while there were these 16 countries that might get it, if there was progress on arms control, if there was a test ban treaty and a reduction in existing arsenals, then other states might decide not to acquire these weapons for themselves. But they warned this would be transitory. If that we did not get a test ban, if there was no progress in nuclear disarmament, then other countries would decide that there was a race going on and they better join it. That logic was understood then, it was understood in the 60s, and I believe if we did an NIE now that examined the relationship between disarmament and proliferation, that link would be reaffirmed. Well, Kennedy fortunately was elected president and he acted on his concern. He formed the agency for arms control and disarmament to have a voice in government for this concern, to balance the concerns of the Department of Defense. He started the process of negotiating a nuclear non-proliferation treaty. He didn't live to finish the job, but LBJ, President Johnson, picked up that baton. He got that treaty negotiated. He told Dean Rusk, Secretary of State, go get me a treaty. Dean Rusk did. And then Richard Nixon ratified it, signed it, and it would have flourished in a Rose Garden ceremony and got the Senate to ratify it overwhelmingly. There were opponents. There were conservatives then, as there are now, who decried arms control, who didn't trust pieces of paper, who said that this was disarming us in face of the Soviet threat. Fortunately, we didn't listen to them. We got that treaty. And that began this 40-year process of Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, working together to build this interlocking system of treaties, security assurances, alliances, that has effectively slowed, if not altogether stopped, the race for nuclear weapons. We now have, counting North Korea, nine countries with nuclear weapons. That's nine too many, but it's not the 15, 20, or 25 that Kennedy feared. And these efforts have really borne fruit in the last 15 years. People don't realize how much progress has been made. We've cut the existing nuclear arsenals in half. At the height of the Cold War, we had about 65,000 nuclear weapons mostly in the hands of the United States and the Soviet Union. Those arsenals have been cut in half to about 27,000. Again, 26,000 of those are owned by the United States and Russia. And those stockpiles are likely to go down through the remainder of this decade. There are fewer countries with nuclear weapons or nuclear programs. In fact, in the last 15 years, more countries have given up nuclear weapons or programs than have tried to acquire them. And these were not easy cases. Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan gave up the thousands of nuclear weapons they inherited at the end of the Cold War when the Soviet Union broke up. Brazil, where the president is visiting this week, used to have a nuclear program, as did Argentina. They had a South American nuclear arms race, Chile, on the edges of this. They ended their program. South Africa, in 1992, on the eve of transition to majority rule, gave up the six nuclear weapons they then declared that they had secretly dismantled them. Their reasons were obvious. They didn't want these weapons in the hand of the black majority. But here's the key. Nelson Mandela could have reversed that decision. But he decided then that South Africa's security was guaranteed better with an Africa free of nuclear weapons than one in which